Hello, I'm Peter Doshi. Thanks for the opportunity to speak, and hopefully you can see my title slide with the financial disclosures. For identification purposes, I'm on the faculty at the University of Maryland and an editor at the BMJ. I have no relevant conflicts of interest, and my comments today are my own. Next slide, please. Last November, the BMJ reported the disclosures of a whistleblower named Brooke Jackson, who worked for Ventavia, a contract research company that ran three of the clinical trial sites for Pfizer's vaccine. Jackson alleged that the company had falsified data, unblinded patients, employed inadequately trained vaccinators, and was too slow, was slow to follow up on adverse events. She provided the BMJ with company emails, internal documents, text messages, photos and recordings of her conversation with company employees. Next slide. This photo, for example, shows vaccine packaging materials that are only supposed to be seen by unblinded staff, just left out in the open. Next slide. And unblinding may have occurred on a far wider scale. Here you can see the document containing the instructions Ventavia staff were given to file each trial participant's randomization and drug assignment confirmation sheet into each participant's chart. This contained unblinded information. Next slide. Unblinding, as I think everybody knows, creates serious concerns about data integrity. Once this massive error was discovered, Ventavia asked staff to go through each and every chart to take out the randomization and drug assignment confirmation. You can see here an email from Ventavia's COO reacting after discovery of the problem. They had not even realized that the drug assignment confirmation contained unblinding information. Next slide. In the heat of a pandemic, it's not hard to imagine that corners were cut and mistakes were made. Some mistakes are benign, but others carry serious consequences to data integrity. One hopes Ventavia is an extreme outlier, but we need more than just hope. We need evidence that the data were dealt with properly. We need regulatory oversight. But despite whistleblower Brooke Jackson's direct complaint to the FDA, FDA never inspected Ventavia. In fact, FDA only inspected nine of the trial's 150 plus sites before approving the vaccine, just nine sites. And, F and Pfizer continues to use Ventavia for trials. Next slide. What about Moderna? FDA had over a year and inspected just one, one of the trial's 99 sites. How can FDA feel confident in the Moderna data based on a 1% sample? Next slide. Data integrity requires adequate regulatory oversight. Trustworthy science requires data transparency. It's been over a year but anonymized participant-level data remain inaccessible to doctors, researchers, and the public. The public paid for these products, and the public takes on the ba balance of benefits and harms post-vaccination. The public has a right to data transparency, and FDA has an obligation to act. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm, I'm Peter Doshi. For identification purposes, I'm on the faculty at the University of Maryland and editor at the BMJ. I have no relevant conflicts of interest, and my comments today are my own. In pharmacy school, I teach a required course on how to critically appraise the medical literature. We train students on how to go beyond a study abstract and start to pick apart and critically assess biomedical studies, not just take them at face value. I want to use my five minutes here to harness that spirit of critical thinking. I'm saddened that we are super saturated as a society right now in the attitude of everybody knows that has shut down intellectual curiosity and led to self-censorship. So let me start with a few everybody knows examples that I'm sure, I'm not sure we should be so certain about. Everybody knows that this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. But if hospitalizations and deaths were almost exclusively occurring in the unvaccinated, why would booster shots be necessary? Or why would the statistics be so different in the UK, where most COVID hospitalizations and deaths are among the fully vaccinated, as Senator Johnson said? There's a disconnect there. There's something to be curious about. There's something not adding up, and we should all be asking, is it true that this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated? What does that even mean? Next slide, please. Then there's this. 
Everybody knows that COVID vaccines save lives. In fact, we've known this from early 2021. The clinical trials proved that to be the case, as you can see here in the quote of a February article in the Journal of the American Medical Association. But is it true? When that statement by prominent public health officials was penned, there had been just one death, one death, across the 70,000 Pfizer and Moderna trial participants. Today we have more data, and you can see that there were similar numbers of deaths in the vaccine and placebo groups. The trials did not show a reduction in death. Even for COVID deaths, as opposed to other causes, the evidence is flimsy with just two deaths in the placebo group versus one in the vaccine group. My point is not that I know the truth about what the vaccine can and cannot do. My point is that those who claimed the trials showed the vaccines were highly effective in saving lives were wrong. The trials did not demonstrate this. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about anti-vaxxers. Everybody knows you should discount what anti-vaxxers have to say, but what does the term mean? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines it as, quote, a person who opposes the use of vaccines or regulations mandating vaccination. The first part of the definition, I expected. The second part stunned me. There are entire countries from the United Kingdom to Japan which do not mandate childhood vaccines. Both achieve high levels of vaccination, just not through regulations mandating vaccines. There are no mandates there, and I would wager that a large minority, perhaps a, major, a majority, of the world's population meets the definition here of an anti-vaxxer. Another definition worth checking is vaccine. Next slide, please. I am one of the academics that argues that these mRNA products, which everybody calls vaccines, are qualitatively different than standard vaccines. And so I found it fascinating to learn that Merriam-Webster changed its definition of vaccine early this year. mRNA products did not meet the definition of vaccine that has been in place for 15 years at Merriam-Webster, but the definition was expanded such that mRNA products are now vaccines. I highlight this to ask a question. How would you feel about mandating COVID vaccines if we didn't call them vaccines? What if these injections were called drugs instead? So here's the scenario. We have this drug, and we have evidence that it doesn't prevent infection, nor does it stop viral transmission. But the drug is understood to reduce your risk of becoming very sick and dying of COVID. Would you take a dose of this drug every six months or so for possibly the rest of your life, if that's what it took for the drug to stay effective? Would you not just take this drug yourself, but support regulations mandating that everybody else around you take this drug? Or would you say, hold on a sec. Maybe you'd say that if that's all the drug does, why not use a normal medicine instead, the kind we take when we're sick and want to get better? And why would you mandate it? The point is, just because we call it a vaccine doesn't mean we should assume these new products are just like all other childhood vaccines which get mandated. Each product is a different product, and if people are okay with mandating something simply because it's a vaccine and we mandate other vaccines, so why shouldn't we mandate this? I think it's time to inject some critical thinking into that conversation, and that is what I hope we're doing today. Thank you.